I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for the Word of God where we can find some stability, some trust. Um, I've gotten to the place in my life where I don't trust virtually what I hear on the news or what any politician says. I don't trust any of them. But I come to God's Word and it's so refreshing to say, I trust you, Lord. I trust what you say. What a great refuge that is for all of us as Christians. That gives me a terrific little segue in that we're going to begin a series now on the person of the Holy Spirit. In theology, this is called pneumatology. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. It's also the Greek word for wind or breath. But we're going to talk in many weeks hence about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, to articulate divine things and even to talk about a divine person is truly possible. The clay lips, the clay feet. So I ask most determinedly, Heavenly Father, that you give me the energy and power and ability to speak of these things to your people that they might be edified and built up and receive the word of God with power and force, ability to change. Holy Spirit, I pray most earnestly that I do you justice and I give you the proper honor that's do your name. Keep me on track, Holy Spirit, so that everything that comes from this teaching is both spirit and life. And I give thanks for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Why are we talking about the Holy Spirit? It's uh, quite amazing in my 40 years of full-time ministry, July 1 was 40 years from me, that uh, the Holy Spirit is probably the most misunderstood person in all of God's creation. Not that he's created, but that he's God. Nobody fully understands the Holy Spirit. Listen to uh, William Booth from 1890, sorry, yeah, 1892. He was born in 1829. Who is William Booth? He's the leader and creator of uh, Salvation Army, which was a tremendous movement that, that started in England, uh, from which they gave us our Sunday schools. He's the one that created the first, it was actually a Saturday school for all the children who were working in factories he would meet with them and instruct them from the Bible and the Sunday school was born. <clears throat> William Booth. <clears throat> he says this in 1892. I consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without the Bible, and heaven without hell. How accurate was he? My goodness, isn't that incredible? Over a century ago he said this, and it's really what we're experiencing even now. But I want to focus on one statement. He said their religion without the Holy Ghost. I wrote down the neglected, misunderstood, maligned, ignored, and ignorance of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Like the demons who said to the seven sons of Sceva when uh, they were trying to be cast them out, the demons, they said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Likewise, we say, God the Father we know, God the Son we know, but God the Holy Spirit, who are you? You see, He's a difficult person to come to understand and know. Here's why. He's invisible. He's mysterious. We're scared of him because we don't know him. I can remember when I was uh, working as a union painter, I had to go on a job site and do some touch-up work on the outside of the exterior of a, of a homeowner's home in a subdivision. And as I approached that house, 
I was aware they had a big dog. I don't remember what kind of dog it was. It looked like a miniature horse. <clears throat> In the yard where I had to work. And the person at the home said to me, don't worry about the dog, he won't bother you. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm 22 years old, I don't know anything. I, so I go back there with my equipment and I open the gate. He comes over and he sniffs me and he looks at me. This dog is a big dog. He's not wagging his tail. He's not wanting to get to know me. And so I was suspicious of him. And on a couple of occasions, he growled at me. I knocked on the door. Can you get your dog? Please bring your dog. Ah, he won't bother you. Don't worry about it. I did that job in total fear. I don't even think I did a very good job. I just did what I had to do and got out of there. Why? Because I didn't know this dog. And so I was afraid of him. She, the lady, had knowledge of the dog, but I didn't. And so my natural inclination is to withdraw. And that's how most people are in the world, especially Christians. They don't understand this third person attorney, so they withdraw. Or they create theologies that don't even include him. You know, it took almost four centuries for the Holy Spirit to make it into the creeds. We love the Father. We know what he did. He chose us for salvation. We, oh, we love the Son. The Son, he did, uh, oh, we see him. You know, we can even go to the Catholic bookstore and buy a picture of him. But the Holy Spirit, we're not so sure sometimes. Why else? Because he's powerful and we can't control him. Anything we can't control, we usually dismiss and we stay away from. He is God, but we treat him like he's an it. Growing up as a young Pentecostal, I was ushered to a prayer meeting since the age of nine. After the church meetings, all the young boys at at the age of nine, we're ushering in prayer meetings until you received it. I had no idea that it was a person. I had no idea that it was God that I was seeking. It. Have you received it yet? Of course, they met tongues. I didn't even know a person was attached to it. <laughs> so we're all struggling to try to speak in tongues because that was the it that we understood. You can't, we treat him like an it. We treat him like water, like he's merely a force, a zap, an experience, a plaything, a carnival attraction. Come see what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And we also forget one incredible thing about this person, the Holy Spirit. His first name is H-O-L-Y. He's holy. He's not some cheap carnival trick that we close the meeting and pour water on each other or something. In 1660, a theologian by the name of Thomas Goodwin said this. He was a Puritan. He said, there's a general omission in the saints of God in their giving the Holy Spirit that glory that is due his person and for his great work of salvation in us inasmuch that we have in our hearts almost forgotten this third person of the Trinity. So it's not a recent problem in the church. It's a historic problem in the church, trying to get to know the third person of the Trinity. The Trinity is understood to be God in three equal persons. God the Father, a person. God the Son, a person. And God the Holy Spirit, a person. Now, as soon as I say that, a lot of people who are not so well-versed in their Bible will question, how can you call this invisible being a person? Well, let's look at the qualifications of a person. And this is my lesson today. The Holy Spirit is a person, if you're thinking so. He's not an it. The qualifications of a person. This is from the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. It's the only one I use because Noah Webster was a man of God and his definitions always include deity. I love that, but you can, you can get it online free. The 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary. 
One time I used it in a paper at Fuller Theological Seminary where I first started studying in San Diego, and they gave me an F on the paper. They said, you'll use an updated Cambridge-based dictionary from now on. And I'm just a new student. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this dictionary? This is a seminary that didn't want included in the definitions any aspect of God. <laughs> Thank God that the Lord delivered me from Fuller, which is now so left and so unbelievable. Sad, Fuller, it used to be a real famous seminary. Now it's all lost its place. Matter of fact, when I went to Covenant Seminary, I had gotten 24 credits from Fuller. They only took eight of them. <laughs> Because they said they know what I received and they don't accept it. <laughs> that was my first introduction into, wait a second. I did all these semesters of work and I get nothing for it. That's right. <clears throat> okay, let's see in the remainder, when, remainder of the time we have together if this invisible, non corporal, what does that mean? He doesn't have a body. Pinch your finger like that. Pinch your finger. That proves that you're corporal. You have a body. If it hurts, if it doesn't hurt, see Jeff afterwards because you're maybe a zombie or something. But corporal means you have a body. Non-corporal means you don't have a physical frame. But in our Western way of thinking, if you don't have a physical frame, you can't be a person. But here's the definition of a person according to Noah Webster 1828. A person is qualified to be a person that possesses a mind, a will, and emotions. A person is a rational, intelligent being. Notice he didn't use the word human here. That's because he always he's making reference to the Godhead as well. So let's see if this invisible person qualifies to be a person according to the scriptures. Our first question, does the spirit have a mind? Does the spirit think? 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. He's comprehending. He's functioning in a thinking capacity. He's qualified to be a person. Romans 8, 27. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is a thinking, rational person so far. Does the Spirit have a will? 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All, their, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. That's the 1 Corinthians 12 is about the body. And the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He, the Holy Spirit, wills. So the Spirit functions with a will. He wills to give Roy a gift of um, compassion. And so He decides that. That's a function of a person. Finally, the Holy Spirit has emotions. This is where the kicker is. And the Bible is full of this. I'm just going to give you a couple. I'm going to go fast. You ready? He can be grieved. Ephesians 4.30. He can be insulted. Hebrews 10.29. You can't insult in it. You got to tell that chair. See that white chair sitting in front of Hannah? Chair, you're ugly. Chair, I don't like you. I don't like your colors. Why don't you get out of here? It, it's not responding because it's an it. But the Holy Spirit can be insulted. <clears throat> he can be lied to. Acts 5 3. Tell Ananias and Sapphira. You want to try that again? The power was so great in the covenant community that when they lied, Peter said, You didn't lie. To man, you lied to God, and he was referencing the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit can be angry, Isaiah 63, 10. The Holy Spirit can be quenched, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. <clears throat> Conclusion, the Holy Spirit is person, the third personal being <clears throat> of the Godhead. 
what are the dangers of not recognizing the Holy Spirit as a personal being? Here's the dangers. And these are basically taken from my own life. Because I lived a long time in ignorance of the third person of the Trinity. I don't blame anybody. It's nobody's fault. But at the same time, in order to love and honor and respect and work with this person, I had to come to know him. The Bible calls it the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And learning to commune with him at all times. Do you know, uh, evangelicals use this phrase all the time, ask Jesus into your heart. You know, it's not in the Bible, that phrase. It's, who is Jesus to us in the, in the Trinitarian understanding? It's the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. But because the Trinity is one, if you say, I have Jesus in my heart, you're not going to hell. But I am saying, you're bypassing relating to a person that has this part of, of the gospel movement in, in redemptive history. It's the Holy Spirit. One of my teachers calls him, don't stumble on this term, the existential Jesus. Meaning the Jesus that you want to appear and be with you now, that's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Christ. You're already staring at me. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for other lessons, okay? <clears throat> the Trinity is not to be fully understood. It's to be experienced. What's the dangers of not recognizing the Holy Spirit as a person? Uh, as we've already seen, it's contrary to the teaching of Scripture. If you say, I don't believe this teaching. He's just an it. He's a force. I'm going to go to the charismatic meeting tonight. I'm going to get zapped. Do you know how disrespectful that is to use that language for a holy person? Now, if you've used it before, God forgive you. If you've forgiven me, I did it. But it's time that we learned how to relate to this invisible, non-corporal person of the Trinity. Number two, the Holy Spirit is not honored or revered as an it. I never considered him God. I never considered him holy. And I think that takes away from his honor and what he has coming due to him as a member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit, number three, can be reduced down to merely, merely being a thing. An influence. I've said it before, a zap from God, a tingle in a meeting, a dancing or flag-waving frenzy, an experience instead of a relationship. God the Holy Spirit, are you ready? Wants to be in relationship with you as in union with Christ. Not just count on him for an experience to do something to you. <clears throat> I've done a lot of premarital counseling in my uh, career. Um, it took me a couple years to realize that it's basically a waste of time. That is, the couple sitting in front of you, the whole time they're looking at you, they're saying, poor man, why don't you just save your breath? We're not like those other people. We're truly in love. And we're going to have a textbook marriage that everybody will emulate. You don't need to keep talking to us. We're okay. I call it divine anesthesia. <laughs> that God injects them with something so they'll go through with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then six months later, guess where they are? In your office. <laughs> He's this, she's that. Yeah, I tried to tell you. Now the anesthesia is worn off, and now we work it out. Right on. <laughs> okay. But I used to ask the couple, you know, in just getting warmed up and everything, just not going straight to the scriptures, I would say, why are you getting married? Oftentimes I would address the bride first. And I'm going to use a name here that we don't have in our congregation, so you won't think I'm thinking of somebody. <clears throat> I would ask the bride, bride uh, <coughs> we'll call her Felicia. Felicia, why are you marrying Wilbur? Why, is that somebody's name? Did I get somebody's name? Shoot. Why are you marrying Wilbur? We don't have any Wilburs, do we? Of course, if I'm here in Troy, we might have some Wilburs. I don't know. 
Why are you marrying Wilbur? Here's what I get as a response, ready? Which caused me to think, you're not ready for marriage, but really nobody's ever ready for marriage. So you do your best. Why are you marrying Wilbur, ready? He makes me laugh. <laughs> Very hard to circumnavigate around that one. But my question inside myself is this. You're relating to Wilbur by an experience? That's it? You're not willing to sacrifice for one another? To stand with, even with the flaws? All those things that go into it. Because what happens in the first month? Some of the laughter kind of dies away. Then at the first child it comes, it, it's not so funny anymore. <laughs> it's not so full with gaiety and uh, eating pie at 11 o'clock and now you got to regulate your bedtime because the child is going to get up before the rooster. But that's our problem as we relate to the Holy Spirit on the basis of an experience alone when he wants to be related to you as the third person of the Trinity. So in closing, it's impossible to consider the Trinity this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Influence. The Holy Trinity is God the Father, a person. God the Son, a person. God the Holy Spirit, a person. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit may be compared to the wind, Acts 2, to water, John 7, or fire, Matthew 3. But the Holy Spirit is not, say not, not. he is not any of those things. It's only a way for us to kind of understand him. But he's not liquid. He's not fire. He's not wind. He is a person. He is holy. And he is God. So next week, we'll be learning about the deity of the Holy Spirit, looking at the scriptures to help us understand that the third person of the Trinity is co-equal with God the Son and God the Father. Let's all stand.